Rather than admitting me into the passenger side of his cab, though, he opened the back door to the windowless compartment of the chip truck and said, Hop in. <laughs> <laughs> I was 17, and I'd been hitchhiking for 55 days, and I was coming home. It was August 28, 1972, and my trans-Canadian adventure had taken me from Victoria, B.C. to Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, and back, almost. This was my last full day on the road, and I was a consummate pro at the art of traveling by thumb. I'd had some close calls and near misses in the previous two months. But this was the home stretch, and I was confidently optimistic of making it back to Victoria by the following day, maybe even this day if all went well. Aunt Alma was a sweetheart and offered to drive me to the highway outside of Lethbridge to begin my day, but she was prone to worry. Oh, George, I just don't feel right leaving you out here by the side of the road all alone, she said. Her eyebrows furrowed, her eyes scrunched, and her mouth turned down with a look of great concern. In the middle of nowhere. Don't worry, Aunt Elma, I said. I won't have to wait long. And I've got that sandwich you made me. I'll be fine. I gave her one final hug before grabbing my backpack, opening the car door and stepping out onto the gravel shoulder. Thanks for the lift, Aunt Elma. I'll say hi to Mom and Dad for you. See ya, I shouted as she pulled away. I turned to face the oncoming traffic and stuck out my thumb. It was a hot, dry August Monday in southern Alberta. Rolling plains of grasses, <clears throat> scrub, and crops, where my Swedish grandparents had settled 60 years earlier to grow sugar beets. I didn't have to wait long for a ride, catching a lift in a truck with a young farmer named Dave, with a pronounced stutter, who took me past Fort McLeod and Pitcher Creek to the small farming town of Cowley on the edge of the foothills. The next lift was with a heavy equipment operator who was willing to put up with my company for the next five hours, all the way to Trail BC, where he worked. We breezed through the foothills and the Crow's Nest Pass in the Southern Rockies and slipped across the BC Alberta border into the Kootenays along Highway No. 3, one of the most scenic drives in BC and a personal favorite of mine. This was a great ride as it took me almost halfway home. I sat back and enjoyed the view, engaging in small talk with the driver, regaling him with stories from the road. From my experience, it usually didn't take more than an hour between rides, maybe two if there was a long lineup, or you were stuck in a particularly conservative redneck area, where kids with long hair, like me, were frowned upon. As a blue-collar town with its fair share of hippie kid bias, I expected that leaving trail might take longer than usual, but was surprised that three hours lapsed before someone decided to stop and pick me up. Finally, some heads, a counterculture term for hippies, stopped to give me a ride. We're just going to Christina Lake. Where are you off to? They asked. Heading home to Victoria. So anywhere further west is great, thanks. I threw my pack into the back seat and climbed in after it. It's about 6 p.m. and the drive to Christina Lake is about an hour. The unexpected delay on trail has changed my plans. I'll try and make it to the Okanagan tonight, I said, maybe a Soyuz or a Penticton to find a hostel. The driver and his friend were American draft dodgers in their 20s, living on a commune near Christina Lake. Canadian roads, communes, and hostels were full of young American men fleeing the draft in the Vietnam War during these years, and the Kootenays seemed to be a particularly popular destination. They dropped me off at what is now known as the Tempo General Store and Gas Station, shortly after 7 p.m. in the village of Christina Lake. The spot looked like it had good, hit, good hitchhiking feng shui. It was close to a gas station and store with access to food and drinks and washrooms. <clears throat> Pardon me and it was on the village strip where cars would have to slow down and abide by the reduced speed limits. Slower cars usually translated into more rides. I imagined that I'd be in a Soyuz by sundown in time to grab a bed and maybe a bite of food at the local hostel. 
There was no shortage of traffic. It was summertime, and Highway 3, officially known as the Crow's Nest Highway, was full of holiday travelers. By 8 o'clock, as the evening light began to wane, <clears throat> and many cars had passed, I became slightly concerned. I don't like to hitchhike at night, I thought. Things can get weird. By 9 o'clock, it was dusk. And despite striking my most pathetic and needy hitchhiking postures, I hadn't had any bites, except for the increasing number of mosquitoes, which hovered incessantly around my head and bare arms. By 10 o'clock, it became clear to me that something was wrong. People were certainly driving by, slowly, too slowly, and looking fearfully at me through their rolled-up car windows. I wonder what's up. This is just as bad as trail, I thought. I was resigning myself to hauling up my sleeping bag and finding shelter in a nearby park. I'll give it another 15 minutes. A bed would be nice. Just then, an old Dutch potato chip truck pulled over to the side of the road ahead of me. At first, I wasn't sure if this was a ride or if the driver had to deal with an emergency. He opened the door of his cab, got out, and walked towards me. I bet you've been stuck here for a while, haven't you? He asked. Yeah, Jesus. Three or four hours, I replied, as I picked up my gear. What's going on? <clears throat> well, there's a murderer loose in this area. Killed some people in a campsite. Just walked in and shot him. The RCMP and local police are looking for the guy. Happened this afternoon. Anyways, I'm driving to Kelowna, so I can get you that far. No wonder it's been such a shitty day for hitchhiking, I replied. I was stuck in trail for three hours this afternoon, too. I appreciate the lift, man. I just want to get out of here. Rather than admitting me into the passenger side of his cab, though, he opened the back door to the windowless compartment of the chip truck and said, Hop in. <laughs> <laughs> the voices in William Bernard Lapine's head told him that he was chosen to save the world from a nuclear holocaust. Although he had spent time in the East Kootenai Mental Health Unit and the Riverview Mental Hospital in Coquitlam, from whence he escaped on July the 30th, he hadn't exhibited any violent behavior. On this day, however, starting around 9 a.m., August 28th, 1972, Lapine, armed with a 22 caliber rifle and a 30 caliber rifle, <coughs> walked into an orchard outside Oliver, B.C., where 16-year-old William Willard Potter and 71-year-old Charles Wright were working on some irrigation equipment and shot both of them dead. Lapine was a 27-year-old American who had worked for a time in the orchards near Summerlin and doing maintenance work for the municipality of Creston before his slide into schizophrenia. Symptoms typically come on gradually in young adulthood and can include delusional thinking, hallucinations, and hearing voices that do not exist. Today, Lapine's tragic internal commands dictated that he kill random innocent people to stave off Armageddon. He put his first victim's bodies in their Land Rover and, with the keys he found in Charles Wright's pocket, <clears throat> drove northeast towards camp, a campground off the Kettle Valley Road. Around 11 a.m., he discarded their bodies in the bushes off the road and entered the campground. The Clarks and the Wilsons had been friends for a long time and liked to go camping together. The Kettle Valley Recreation Area was one of their favorite places to park their motorhomes and spend a weekend hiking picking huckleberries, and sitting around the fire at night drinking a few beers and sharing some laughs. Around noon on this day, William Lapine entered the campsite, chatted briefly with Lester and Phyllis Clark and Alan and Mildred Wilson, and then left. A short while later, he returned, armed with one of his rifles. He ordered the two couples into a truck and started shooting, killing Phyllis Clark immediately and wounding the other three. After inflicting this horror on the unsuspecting campers, Lapine escaped in the stolen Land Rover, while Lester and Alan, bleeding profusely and in shock, placed Phyllis's body in the Clark vehicle and then followed the Wilsons 20 miles towards Westbridge in search of help. After receiving critical medical care in Westbridge, the wounded survivors were able to give the Royal Canadian Mounted Police the information they needed to begin their manhunt in which about 25 officers participated. Patrols went out, roadblocks were set up, and radio stations were alerted to warn the public that an armed killer was on the loose.
by three o'clock that afternoon, or sorry, by three o'clock that afternoon, as I was being dropped off by the roadside and trail, the hunt for William Lapine was moving into high gear. And then he killed again. How many murders does it take to stop a nuclear holocaust? As he went about his unfathomable, unfathomable mission, neither Lapine nor his internal voices could provide an answer. It's over when it's over, when the shooter is caught or shot. After the campsite carnage, Lapine drove several hours north to the small village of Edgewood on the shores of the Upper Arrow Lake. It was late afternoon on a beautiful summer day at the end of August, and 57-year-old Herbert and his 56-year-old wife Nellie, Thomas, were enjoying life and each other's company when the young, unshaven man approached. Nothing could prepare them for what was to follow. Without warning or explanation, Lapine pulled out his rifle and shot and killed them both. After hiding their bodies nearby, he escaped in their car, drove an additional 30 miles north and shot and killed 24-year-old Thomas Posney, who was enjoying a little quiet fishing time on the Lower Arrow Lake near, uh, near Nacusp. I was surprised that the driver of the old Dutch potato chip truck was putting me in the storage compartment of the cube van. <laughs> in the dark, windowless space with all the merchandise. But it was a lift, and I'd been languishing by the side of the road for hours. And there was an active shooter, a murderer, on the loose. I hopped in, and he closed the door. When the driver closed the door, every last bit of light was gone. It became absolutely, completely dark, and I became blind. I had to feel my way with toes and outstretched hands between the boxes of chips, pretzels, and pepperoni sticks to a place against the wall where I could stretch out. It was a 12 by 6 by 6 box, 432 cubic feet of pungent Old Dutch product, line aromas, salt and vinegar, barbecue, sour cream, <laughs> <laughs> sour cream and onion, cheesy popcorn, <clears throat> ketchup flavored, and original, saturated the air. Just as I was thinking that the driver wouldn't miss a couple of bags of chips, <laughs> a male voice in the darkness said, Hey man, <laughs> where are you going? <laughs> I didn't know that I had company in the box. <laughs> Momentarily startled by this revelation, I tried, with no success, to determine exactly where he was inside the cube, and if there were others. <laughs> Heading back to Victoria, I replied, I replied guardedly, my thoughts turning from chips to murderers. <laughs> I didn't know there was anyone else in here. Where are you going? I asked. Uh, I'm trying to get to Penticton, he replied. Pretty wild about the murderer, eh? He sounded young, maybe about my age, and seemed amicable. I wasn't getting a strong vibe of crazy serial killer in the dark. Mm -hmm. So our conversation turned to comparisons of our experiences on the road. He was from Winnipeg and was going to the Okanagan to pick fruit or find other work. He too had been stuck for, stuck for hours this afternoon in Salmo before catching a lift with the potato chip Samaritan. Or at least the driver seemed like a real old Dutch potato chip truck driver. <laughs> Maybe he killed the real driver and was impersonating him, we speculated jokingly. And then, in the middle of nowhere, the truck slowed down and stopped. We could hear the driver get out of his cab and slam the door. There were noises and muffled voices outside. Moments later, the door flung open, and two powerful flashlights beamed in, hurting our eyes, which had become accustomed to the dark. Okay, gentlemen, said the authoritative male voice, authoritative male voice. I'll have to ask you to get out of the truck. We hopped out smelling like potato chips, and a cordon of Mounties holding shotguns at the ready, near a roadblock of police cruisers with lights flashing. My initial fear that the driver was the murderer and was stopping to kill us was now replaced by the fear that the cops would search my backpack and find my small stash of marijuana and my pipe. I'll need to see some ID, lads. No doubt you've heard that there's a murderer on the loose. We're just checking to make sure you aren't him, he said. The roadblock had been set up at the junction with Highway 41, which was an access route to the U.S. border in case our fugitive decided to flee south. 
He was, after all, American. This was the first time I'd seen my traveling companion, another young, young, long-haired denizen of the hitchhiking culture that was so popular during the late 60s and early 70s. We didn't talk much while we were being scrutinized by the cops. I found out later he too was worried about them finding his stash of hash and two hits of mescaline. <laughs> but the police had larger concerns than the contraband of teenage hippies. A second murder victim had been found and four other missing person reports had been filed. Mm -hmm. It was bad and appeared to be getting worse. They had to find Lapine. We were back in the windowless potato chip truck talking about the weirdness of our situation and whether or not we should do the mescaline. <laughs> we decided that it might be a bad idea in the off chance that we might have to disarm a psychopath <laughs> or brave another police roadblock. The driver had decided to shorten his trip to Kelowna by taking Highway 33 through Westbridge mm -hmm. rather than the longer Highway 97 route through the Okanagan. My choice was to get dropped off on the side of the road near Rock Creek around midnight with a mass murderer on the loose and try to get a ride into a Soyuz mm -hmm. or to continue to Kelowna, which would put us at the hostel around 2, 2 a.m. It was not a difficult choice. We arrived at the hostel shortly before 2 a.m., fully expecting that it would be closed and that we'd have to sleep outside. Luckily, two of the hostel staff were up, quite stoned and playing go, and they let us in. We thanked the driver for delivering us from evil, and he gave us a box of Schneider's pepperoni sticks <laughs> as a parting gift, which we and our hosts eagerly devoured. Think munchies. <laughs> anyway, there's a little epilogue that's pretty much the story, but um, here's the epilogue for you. William Lapine was caught and arrested the next morning at Galena Bay and taken to the RCMP office in the cusp before being transferred to Nelson, bringing his murderous rampage to an end. He was ultimately tried and found not guilty by reason of insanity and placed in the forensic psychiatric hospital in Port Coquitlam, where he remains to this day. I made it back to Victoria the following day, having to wait another three hours outside of Kelowna for a lift, likely because of the fucking murderer, <laughs> according to my journal. I kept, it, I kept a journal at that time. <laughs> my immersion in the darkness, fear, and potato chips has not diminished my enjoyment of old Dutch products. <laughs> my favorite is still original. <laughs> Nearly 30 years later, I would meet Jackie and her sister Barbie, who had both become very good friends of mine. As it so turned out, they are the granddaughters of Alan and Mildred Wilson, who had been shot and wounded in the campsite in the Kettle Valley on that late August day, and who drove those desperate miles to Westbridge for help. Jackie and Barbie have attended parole hearings for the past 25 years to speak of their family's pain and help prevent the release of William Bernard Lapine. I have been invited to attend one of those hearings, and if the fates allow, I will go. Mm. There's a little epilogue to the epilogue. <laughs> <laughs> that was written a couple of years ago. I actually did attend one of the parole hearings by telephone. Oh, oh. So I managed to sit in. I kind of brought in on the listening aspect of it because it was during the pandemic, I think. Mm. And uh, so I heard his voice. I heard his rationale. And the mm. psychiatrists were just, you know, he sounded like a normal guy. You're kind of listening to this guy and he's got rationale and all this stuff. And then finally they they kind of brought him around to admitting, well, I had to kill those people, you know, like, yeah, yeah. so really he was trying to get out of, mm -hmm. of prison, of psychiatric prison, but he was uh, put back in. And recently I had lunch with Jackie and she showed me a little video clip of the last parole hearing he was at. So I actually got oh. to see this guy oh. and, you know, he looks like an old guy in a, an outfit, you know, yeah. a, a prison garb outfit. Anyway, that's it. Okay.